Hey, this is Latif Mikado, and you're listening to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast, where I take some time each night to try and reflect on the freestyle scene, where it is, where it's going, and try to figure out how to sustain it, not just for future generations to enjoy, but also to benefit. So sit back, relax, and let's talk some freestyle. Hey, what's up, everyone? It's Latif, and welcome to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast. Uh, This is episode 42. It's a Tuesday night, um, February 11th. Getting ready for the show this weekend. Um, Today I worked... uh, uh, Quite a few calls came in today, so it was... uh, I get a lot of window shopping, especially at the beginning of the year. So January, February, anybody who's booking now usually called me already before the holidays. So um, now people are looking into spring. So they'll call now looking for, you know, April, May, going into the summer. We have the Aprils, the Mays. We have the Junes already with my acts. And we'll continue. I have a couple of private parties that are for almost a year out. So... um, yeah, so people do book, you know, uh, uh, that far out. Not not a club, not a, you know, a concert. Those anywhere from three to maybe four months. Once in a while you get a six-month, not, not, not often. Uh, but when it comes to private parties, anniversaries, stuff like that, a year is very common. Uh, some people will lock it in with deposit and everything <clears throat> a year prior. Some people will kind of put a feel out there and then... Uh, They'll call back in a few months and then they'll lock it in. So, because they can't really rely on us until they put a deposit in. If a, if someone calls us for a show and we tell them, yeah, we're, we're open on Valentine's Day. And then they say, okay, we'll call you back. I'm going to let me, and they take some time to, whether it's to get together their money or to find a venue or to make sure it's something that they want to do. <clears throat> if during that time we get a phone call, um... For another show, uh, we're gonna take it. We're not gonna. We're not gonna wait. We don't do that with anybody. So um, we just take the next show because uh, usually when people are ready to book, they book right away. You know, if they're waiting, if they're taking some time, that means they're hesitant. So it could go either way. I've seen it still come through. I've seen it also fall out. I've seen it fall out to the point where the promoters don't even you can't even reach them anymore. Like they totally disappear so <clears throat> so um yeah so what we do is uh same thing you know we don't we can't the clubs can't advertise private private events do not advertise an act um it's a party it's a private party um some artists uh payments are different some artists charge more some artists actually charge less and some artists basically just uh stay across the board the same price um, we do that. That's us. We stay across, uh, same price straight across. Um, the only time our prices change, it's not even by capacity, is if it's overseas, then it's a different ball game. So, um, and it's usually priced, uh, for convenience, <laughs> you know? So, uh, just, you know, going through all the red tape to have to go overseas is, um, and then the trip and leaving the family, that's, Stuff that not everybody desires, especially uh, with freestyle, because a lot of people have families. So it's not like you got young rappers; they're by themselves. They'll they'll grab their boy or their girl. They'll disappear for three months. You wouldn't see them, <laughs> so or more. You know they'll tour, but uh, as they got older, uh, settle down. That doesn't fly anymore. Not only that, nobody really wants to do that anymore. That's a lot of wear and tear. You gotta be prepared for that. <laughs> you know. A lot of, you know, if you're flying a lot, it's a lot of jet lag, a lot of wear and tear on the knees and going through this, uh, going through security and going through all of that. Um, if you're doing private, that's cool too. Sometimes the promoters will give you private uh, because they, they do the math and they see that uh, the amount of money it would cost for them to fly everybody out, uh, they're better off um, getting a private, uh, private jet and uh traveling that way so 
<clears throat> we don't do too much uh, private jets. It's been a while since I've been on one, so. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So that's pretty much how that how that ball bounces. Uh, everything else is cool. There was a, a post today that I just um, replied to. Um, you've probably seen it already, but I don't need to mention anybody's name. Uh, they were public about it, so I'm not. But I'm not. I don't need to mention it here, so because uh, who it is doesn't matter. It's more along the point, but. Basically, she took a picture of her with her son. He looked like a teenage son. And she starts off by saying, this is my son. And he's addicted to drugs or he's a drug addict. Or, or he, he's, he's hooked on drugs. One of those. But anyway. Um, and what she did and what she said took a lot. And I think that was probably more therapeutic for her than anybody else. Like, um, you know, it's hard to hide something like that. And uh, I posted, I posted, um, I, I, I replied to her post. A lot of people did actually. A couple of people had similar problems. Other people just well wishes. Other people had kids or family members that went through it. You know, um, I was one of the ones that went through it. <laughs> so. And I, I post about it. I gave out. I, I didn't want it to be about me. It's about her. But I, I want to make a point. And, and the point was, wasn't the fact that he's on drugs and I was once on drugs and I recovered. And so he's going to recover. That wasn't even the point. The point had nothing to do with that. Not when I wrote it. The point that I made, I was trying to make was to the mother. Don't give up. Stay by, stick by his side. Fight with him. Um, do not turn your back on him. Do not ignore him. Um, be by his side, no matter what anybody says. Let him know he's loved, and that people are. Are rooting for him you know um, it kind of makes you accountable when it's when it's done when it's done like that um, I had a similar problem my problem was bad I was just, I grew up in Jackson Heights Queens which was the cocaine capital of New York back in the 80s and what it was a lot of the Colombians were moving into that area and um, <clears throat> so there was a lot of business going on in that area. So, um, and I got caught up, <clears throat> you know, started off like anything casual, chilling with, the, chilling with your friends. You know, you came in 40, you get to the point where you're like in the beginning, you're like, I would never buy that. I would never buy it. You just kind of do everybody else's shit. You know, and then the next thing you know, you go down half with somebody. You know, you, you put half, I put half, you know, so you do that route. You guys do that a few times. Then it gets to a point where you buy your own. Okay? Um, and then if you get as bad as I got, not only do you buy your own, you buy for other people in hopes that you get something back in return. Whether it was some of their stuff or some extra money on top, whatever the case may be. So, um, my neighborhood, I'm, I'm, I'm light-skinned Puerto Rican. In my neighborhood, they really didn't even speak English. It was like I said, it was all Colombian, mostly Cuban. It's pretty, pretty diverse. Uh, um, a lot of South Americans. Uh, we didn't have Mexicans, not that many there at that time. We had like um, Salvadorians, Costa Ricans. We didn't have Puerto Ricans where I lived. Nine Queens in the Bronx, we did, yeah, but nine Queens. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so, you know, during the 80s, it got real bad in Jackson Heights. I'm talking about people walking around like zombies between sniffing it and smoking it. And uh, the Colombians call it bazooka. Um, it was basically the same as crack. It's just it was refined more into like a powder. And once it was created like that and the way they cut it up, it was burnable. So you could put it in a pipe. You could put it in a cigarette, you could put it in a joint, whatever. Um, and that's how you got high. So, but it was highly addictive, like crack, you know. 
um, short burst and you smoke it and next thing you know you're good for a minute and then it goes away and you're ready for the next one you can live your you can live for a very long time like that you know until you can't live no more put it that way <laughs> um so you know I went you know I started off it was it was a weird time because it was like after high school like in high school I smoked a little weed nothing much I was like after I finished high school that I started to real really dabble and things were getting a little carried away. By that time, I was able to get get in the train. You know, I was able to go out. My mother wasn't sweating me at that time. I was, you know, adolescent or young adult, whatever you want to call me. Um, and then, uh, you know, like I said, it, you know, starts off with you sharing, going halves with somebody, and then you buy your own. The next thing you know, you buy for other people, and that's the point I was trying to get to before is, um, I I was taking a lot of. Yeah, a, a lot of um, a lot of people used to come from you know outside like maybe Long Island, sometimes from other boroughs or some other parts of Queens, and they would come to that area to to cop stuff, to buy stuff, and a lot of times the Colombians will see them coming and basically disappear because if they didn't know you, you you're not gonna get much, you're not gonna get pretty much anything, you know, so they rather go through a third party. Um, if they can, uh, in hopes that that third party is the one that, um, you know, the delivery person, the trafficker, whatever is the one that gets busted. So, um, and they figure, you know, if you're bringing, you know, if you're getting the stuff for somebody, then you're the one that's going to, you know, wind up getting caught. So, but anyway, what we used to do is, um, these guys used to come and that's how bad things were because I didn't give no thought. Well, I give a little thought. Are you a cop? Let me tell you something. It was so stupid. That we used to ask them, okay, okay, because they used to come to us, yo, yo, can you, can you pick me up, whatever, you know? And um, so first thing you ask them, you look at them, you're like, are you a cop? <laughs> and they go, no, I'm not a cop, you know? <laughs> and we were, okay. <laughs> and then we would go, and <laughs> you know how many of them dudes that said they weren't cops lied to me? I remember telling one guy, I said, you lied to me. That was a trap off, <laughs> but um. Anyway, so you know, but when you you you're really getting down and dirty, man, you're not really thinking about that. You're not thinking about the consequences. You're just like, it's worth the risk, man. It's worth the risk. So you know, you end up, um. You know, you then there's a few ways that you make money. Sometimes they'll add, they'll give you five dollars, maybe ten dollars, depending how much they're getting. That's enough for you to get something. So you could go and make the whole transaction. The other way is they'll get high with you. The other way is they'll give you a little bit of whatever they bought. So that way, you know, at that point, they bought quite a bit. So they have enough to, they could share. Um, Then the dirty way was we would do the old switcheroo. Okay. So what I used to do, I'm going to give away my, my secrets here. Don't, don't, don't nobody, don't, don't try this at home. (laughs) Anyway, um, (laughs) I would go up to the sixth floor, sit on the steps, and I always had a little knife or something on me. And I would start to scrape the plaster walls. And I would take that scrapings and I would put them in a little bag. And I would and it would be a bag that I used that had something in it earlier. And I would make and we called them dummies. And we would make the little packages, right? So when these when these a lot of times when these white boys came in to buy from us and then a lot of times they were older dudes too when they came in a lot of times they didn't they waited till they get home to to get hot they didn't do it right there on the spot they didn't do it up the block they went they went home and if they lived far you could tell when they bought a lot that they lived far if they just bought a little bag and then you saw them again later on then they're not far they're close by the by the neighborhood once in a while you find somebody just chilling out in their car getting high coming out buying some more or they'll be in a building it was it was oh my god what a what a time um but when we used to do the old switcheroo is i would go and of course purchase what i needed to purchase pop that into my uh pocket uh and then take out the dummy 
And so when they when I handed it off, that's why I handed them. I handed them the dummy, and they took they thanked me, <laughs> and they took off running. And let me tell you something, man. When you're getting high like that, and you're waiting for that hit, and that hit is nothing what you expected, honestly, you want to kill somebody. It gets really, really bad. Okay. It was just, we were just fortunate that when we got daring and we did people like that, that was close by in the neighborhood, a lot of times you had to disappear too. And you had to make sure it was worth it, you know? Or when you come back into the neighborhood, in the, you have to be on the lookout. You got to be ducking behind cars or <laughs> beside a high buildings or rooftops were my favorite. But I see everybody, I see the cops coming, I see everybody on the, with the roof, from the rooftop, you know? So, but, um, but we, yeah, so, you know, so it was, it was worth the risk. Um, a couple of times I got, I got caught out there. One, one time a uh, guy calls me over. I didn't know that uh, to his car. And I didn't realize the guy that was sitting behind him was the guy that I had just beat. And when I went to say what's up to the, to the, the guy in the passenger side, they grabbed me and they pulled me halfway into the car. They put a gun in my mouth, big silver gun, nickel-coated gun, and they took off. They started driving. And I couldn't see, but it felt like they were, like, I don't remember them slowing down, stopping. So they were basically running late, lights. So if they're going that fast, the first thing I think, okay, well, they're just going to shoot me in my mouth. And my, yeah, they're going to kill me instantly, and they're going to let me drop. That's it. They're going to let me drop. So, um... But they didn't. They made a turn and they let me go and I busted my ass. <laughs> uh, but basically what it was, they gave me a fat lip too from the gun. They just, good thing they didn't break my teeth. But um, I don't know what the situation was. I didn't know if he was going to buy with somebody or maybe he was. they were family members. And you know what I'm saying? So I don't know. But uh, then the second time, uh, it was crazy. It was like, it must have been like, 5 a.m. It was just getting light. You know, when you first see that first bird comes out, sky was like, you know, bluish, still dark, but it's bluish. So, you know, within the next 15 minutes, it's going to be daylight. You already see people leaving. They're going to, they're going to work. That's when you, that was one of the worst feelings in the world <laughs> when you saw everybody going to work and you're still out all night. Um, but, um, uh, Yeah, so. <clears throat> yeah, so, you know, you see it when, this, when the sky starts to get, like, bluish. And you see people going to work. You know, it's like the worst feeling in the world to know that you've been out up all night getting high. And people are actually leaving to work. You know, so but anyway, it was around that time and I hear somebody walk from behind me. And when I turned around, it was a guy that I had bought something for. And I kind of got excited because I thought he was coming back for me to buy more. But I forgot that I beat him. I, I gave him a dummy. And all of a sudden, this was a big dude. I think at that time I was maybe 160 pounds. Like I was skinny, man. And... <clears throat> This guy must have been, I'm six feet. This guy had to be about six, six, about 300 pounds. And he was balding with the hair around his ears. He had glass. He looked crazy, man. Big dude, um, white guy. And um, he was sweating. That's what I remember. I remember sweat just pouring down his forehead and, and his the sides of his face. Next thing you know, I see his shoulder. I see him do something. And I see him coming up with his hand. First, I thought it was going to punch. I thought he was going to punch me. And I blocked it. Like, I grabbed his hand, and it was a knife. He had a knife. So he was shooting upwards to stab me up in, like, the top part of my, my neck, you know? I didn't realize that until I grabbed his hand. And now he's trying to, we're kind of wrestling now. And he's not. It's weird because he wasn't, like, holding me. Like, he could have did so much. He could have punched me. He just stood trying with one hand trying to get this knife up into my throat and 
I put my hands over it and I was just holding it. And I was strong as hell at that point because, you know, but I was scared. And then finally somebody came out or he saw somebody and he, he, he let go and then he ran away and I never seen him again. And I was like, wow, the thing is, this dude looked like a murderer. Like if you saw, if they would have posted his picture on the news, you, you would have walked right by. It was like, he looked like every other murderer. <laughs> typical typical uh which is stereotypical <laughs> you know big crazy ass looking um crazy it was nuts man but um well yeah so <clears throat> so you know one of the things that um that i was that i wrote is that you know i said um never give up you know if any of you have any uh, loved ones who are you know battling with addiction in any way you know you're gonna get people who unsympathetic maybe it's the way they are saying oh turn your back on them don't 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 let them in the house don't give them no money don't 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 you know just disown them don't you call the cops you know my mother refused to do any of that she refused to do any of that and that was one of the things that really moved me it, it kind of made me almost like like I, I owed her you know and I was now accountable to her. You got to realize I didn't have any kids. I didn't have anybody. I only had her. So I was dependent on her. I had nobody who depended on me at all. My mother depended on me to get well, but she didn't rely on me for her survival. I did, you know? Um, and when I went away, um, Again, she continued to, you know, she was the only one. She came to visit. She wrote letters. She made sure I had money, commissary. Um, she did the entire bid with me. The entire bid. And um, when I came home, I got to enjoy her for maybe another 10 years. And then she passed away, you know. So um, if you guys ever read my book, um, Freestyle for Life, the first novel, um, there's a scene in there where a friend of mine gets on the phone. I remember because I was standing right behind him. And I put this into the book. A lot of the book is parallel to what has happened to me. Not everything, but a good portion of it. Some stuff also I lightened because it was a little bit too too much. Others I kind of uh, boosted up a little bit to make it a little bit more enjoyable to read. But the essence was all there. But in this particular case... Um, I was standing online and my boy was right in front of me and he gets on the phone and he's talking to his sister. Next thing you know, he takes the phone and he had a long cord and he throws it down, he slams it and then he jumps up in the air and he lands like on his face on in the concrete. So I ended up grabbing him, my other boy grabbed him we go, and we, we were, there was a bed right there and we kind of held him down the bed. And all he kept saying was, Ma, why didn't you wait for me? See, my boy was leaving in less than two weeks. He had about 10 days left. I think he was in there. He couldn't have been in there more than a year. So I think he was in there about a year. Um, if he was in there longer, it's because he laid up uh, detention. But I think it was only like a year, maybe 18 months at the most. And now he was about 10 days short. He's about to be out. About a week, and his mother dies. Now, let me tell you something. At that moment, it didn't struck. It didn't struck me because he was trying to hurt himself. He was jumping over the bed when we let him go. It was, you know, it's, a, it's prison. It's a concrete floor, and and uh, he was just trying to hurt himself. And I didn't think about it at that time because we were just trying to keep him from hurting himself. But I remember that night laying there and all of, us, all of a sudden getting this really crazy anxiety attack. Never knew what that was. I learned later on what an anxiety attack was. But it's basically what I had that night. Right away I started thinking about, I don't have 10 days. I have a lot longer than 10 days. I was pretty new in there. I think I still had maybe eight months to a year. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, my mother, I said, I started, it kept playing over and over in my head. 
And I was like, what am I going to do? What will I do if something happens to my mother while I'm incarcerated? Now, I had an aunt that passed away. And I remember I, I was trying to, we were close. They didn't want to let me go see her or nothing. It was done. It was only immediate family. And even until right now, I don't even, uh, I'm not clear as to what's immediate family. Is that your parents or is that like your wife and kids? So, um, I was neither to my aunt. I was her nephew. But they didn't let me. But then I, and I knew if it's my mother, they're, they're going to let me go. But, man, you know, I knew the only, the, one of the big missions that I had was to come out before she did pass and make, make sure that she knew that I was going to be okay. I knew that just that alone will put her at peace. And I, and I did. When I came out, I didn't mess around. I worked. I hustled. I was happy. I had my son. I had my daughter. And, you know, hustling with my business and, you know, traveling the country, basically. I don't, I don't travel the world, really. Traveling the country. Um, life was good. Life was good. So, um, yeah, it was just, just crazy. I just wanted to bring that up. So, you know, any of you guys who... Uh, who know anybody, or if you're dealing with it yourself, you know, it's not the end of the world. People, a lot of people pull out. Just keep your head up and just keep it in your mind that you can do it. It's gonna be hard though, but you can do it. Anyway, all right, guys, I'm gonna cut this one short. Um, just wanted to bring that up. Just it was it was, uh, it was interesting, and it, it took a lot of bravery for somebody to write write that let alone post a picture so anyway wishing you guys all the best and until tomorrow good night freestyle before i lay me down to sleep i pray to hear a freestyle beat for if i die before i wake i hope to make it to the break